The majority of Americans now say they disapprove of Israeli action in Gaza. That's according to a recent Gallup poll that showed a 14% drop in approval since November. But that's not to say Americans haven't always been split on both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. People are saying that it's not terrorism and that it is justified because Israel is Israel. But if you look at what is actually happening, you don't kidnap, rape, murder, innocent women, children, kids. In Gaza, we're watching famine and starvation taking place. This is not what the Christianity called for. This is not what Islam called for. It's not what Judaism called for. Today, there's a time for war and a time for My peace. Friends, and it's, we must think it's unfortunate and it's hostages. sad that this feels like it's, it's a time for war. People forget that these are real people. Real children, real families, real homes that are being destroyed. There's many people that we know that have been killed, murdered. They could not do anything besides sitting at home, watch the, the news and just crying. What we've been doing, uh, by we I mean Israel and the United States primarily, to the Palestinian people for decades is horrific. Israel is continuing to receive increased domestic and international backlash after seven aid workers were killed by an Israeli strike in Gaza. Joining us now is Chris Steyerwalt, News Nation's political editor and anchor of The Hill Sunday with Chris Steyerwalt. Chris, thank you so much to be here. It's great to see you um, in a setting that's not um, at The Hill Show studio. Um, you know, just to jump into it, do you, th you know, we're talking about the Israel-Gaza war. And just to start off with, do you think the Israeli strike on the world's central kitchen workers marks a turning point in how Americans and really the rest of the world view Israel's handling? of the war? Well, America had, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And it's, uh, I'm a little nervous because instead of being co-panelist now, you can grill me. So <laughs> I, I, here, here I am. Um, but look, America has a really unfortunate celebrity culture. We are celebrity obsessed. Um, and when Jose Andres, who is a celebrity, this comes close to a very famous person, um, Americans engage in a different way and start to look at it differently. And, you know, the, the, the sad truth, of course, is that there's so much, so much when, when you have a war, there is so much bad that happens. There is so much suffering. There is so much hurt. Uh, and that's true, not just obviously in this conflict, but in Ukraine or in the, in the civil wars in, in, in Haiti, uh, around the world. Uh, the focus on Israel here because of that strike and because of uh, the uh, notoriety that Andres brings to it does change it. But I tend to think that uh, this falls more into the category of what we see with, um, tragically, uh, mass shootings. Mm -hmm. There's a period of time where people are really engaged. They really talk about it. They're really interested because there's a high visibility event. And then a week later, it's, uh, I think it's, it's back to the same. And do you think part of it, you know, part of we, we mentioned that Jose Andres is obviously a celebrity, but he has a lot of connections here in Washington. He's able to call the president and talk to him one on one. Um, do you think part of this has to do with his own influence? I'm, uh, look, he, uh, he's, he's, I'm sure, quite a good lobbyist uh, and all of that. But you can't. There, there is no amount of lobbying that changes the political uh, predicament that Biden finds himself in, which is basically this. You have Biden's underperforming his 2020 numbers by 6.7 points, basically, uh, in the swing states. And there's two groups of voters in there. There's a group of voters who are uh, furious at Biden for his support for Israel, furious about this accident, furious about so many things. And they're angry at the president and they're disaffected. They say, I may not vote for Trump, but maybe I'll vote for RFK. Maybe I'll do something else. Maybe I'll stay home. And then there are the voters who would be extraordinarily displeased with Biden. And here we think about suburban Philadelphia particularly, right. but the suburbs of Detroit and of Milwaukee, uh, where there's lots of folks who would not like to see Biden uh, uh, cut ties with Israel or back away or, or do that stuff. So he, is, he has this fragile coalition, and the, the part of these voters who are not coming home for him right now disagree with each other. So that's, that's very difficult.
You know, on the Biden note, it's obviously no secret that he and Benjamin Netanyahu do not see eye to eye on most things. Um, Biden has condemned the airstrike on the World Central Kitchen workers and has said that Israel has not done enough to avoid civilian casualties. Uh, the president even hinted at a potential policy change toward Israel recently. What do you think that, could, that change could look like, and will we even see that substantial of a change in U.S.-Israel policy? Well, I, I, think, I think it is probably unlikely that we will see that disruption in a, in a significant way simply because Israel ends up being too valuable of a U.S. ally. Um, the, the, the Middle East uh, is divided into two, two poles of power. Uh, one are the Sunni, uh, the, where the Saudis are the, the leading power. And then you have the Shia and the Iranians on the other side. And Israel, now whether Israel is cast out of uh, the, their good relationship or improved relationship with these Sunni states, I don't know. Uh, but Israel has ended up being a linchpin for the United States in balancing against Iran. Uh, and that has, we remember the Abraham Accords in the Trump administration, but Israel's strategic importance for the United States uh, has not decreased. And the need for a functioning relationship, a good relationship with Israel probably doesn't go away because of this. It's always so interesting to see certain foreign policy issues really um, permeate, I guess, U.S. politics, particularly during an election year. And we're even seeing this during the Democratic primary. The recent uncommitted vote in Wisconsin received 50,000 votes, and this comes after the movement performed pretty well in Michigan and Minnesota. How big of an issue electorally is this for Biden? Could this sink his chances in the general election in Michigan and Wisconsin? Well, you know, there's a funny thing that happens when you have close elections is that voters come to understand that maybe they have veto power, right? So we can think about on the other side, the traditional conservatives, sort of the Haley voters uh, with the Republicans. They think, you know, we could cost you this election because one of the, the problems that we've had in America is we've had so many close elections for so long, right? We haven't had, we haven't had a good gully washer come through and, and sort of reset things politically. We keep, ha we keep playing this game between the 45 yard lines. So if you are uh, anti-Israel or if you are uh, uh, staunchly in favor of a ceasefire, even if it's unilateral, if this matters a lot to you, you look at those numbers in these states where it's very close, right? In a lot of these states, you're talking about 10 or 20,000 votes out of millions cast. And people say, well, we could be enough to deprive Joe Biden of his victory, and then we'd, then we'd show him. But then the next part is the problem, which is, and you'll show him by doing what? shown by making Donald Trump president. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Joe Biden is going to do, that Democrats are going to do, is say to these voters, OK, hippie, I hear you. <laughs> I, you're mad. You're very mad. Here's what Donald Trump has to say about Israel, about finish the job, about uh, his support for uh, an escalation in Israel. So if that's what you want, you stay home and you'll get Donald Trump. So we're talking so much about the Arab American vote, how it's playing in you know, Wisconsin, notably Michigan and the Detroit area. But you know, there's also the Jewish American vote, and you also have a very strong pro-Israel lobby in this country. We're seeing groups like APAC pour money into Democratic primaries, and particularly in the House. Um, you know, Cory Bush's district in Missouri, Jamal Bowman's in New York. Um, you know, potentially down the line, Summer Lee's, and uh, just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Talk about the power of the pro-Israel lobby, but also the Jewish vote, because we know that there are very um, important house districts or critical house districts that, um, you know, encompass an area with a large Jewish population? There are more Jewish voters in the state of New York than there are Arab American voters in the entire country. Um, and when we look at Florida, when we look at Pennsylvania, uh, as well as a bunch of those competitive congressional districts in New York, there are lots and lots of Jewish voters. And one of the things that studies have shown us 
recent surveys have shown us, is that as Jewish Americans become more anxious about anti-Semitism, right, as we've seen the increase in anti-Semitic attacks and rhetoric and people have become alarmed, just watching what happened on October 7th has been so alarming for so many that I think it has strengthened their identity as uh, as Jews, as Jewish Americans, and it, it brings that issue to the fore. So this goes right back to the the box where Biden finds himself, which is, yeah, you want to you want to say soothing things uh, in Michigan, right? Because there are probably a quarter million Arab Americans or so living in the Metro Detroit area. That's a big number. But then when you look at where Jewish voters are across the country. They're in a bunch of districts. They're in a bunch of places where they're very consequential. And so the idea that there is a a binary choice here that Biden can make to get himself out of political trouble, there isn't. There's just not, there's, it's not an either or a question. It's a both and. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, I want to move on to a much lighter topic before you go. I want to talk about your new show, The Hill Sunday. What can viewers expect and, you know, how is it different from other Sunday shows and other public affairs shows? Well, I don't really know what I'm doing, so that makes it different, right? Uh, (laughs) But um, what what we have, I hope, is a lot of what you get to be part of uh, frequently on the weekday show um, is a general commitment to the idea that uh, politics uh, is not about a struggle between good and evil, but is about competing goods, right? Um, That there are a lot of good things uh, that in a republic have to be held in tension with each other. Uh, Freedom and order is the most most obvious example, Um, but let's take immigration. On yeah. the question of immigration, we we need lots of immigrants in the United States, more than a million a year we need in the United States just to fill the jobs and, and do the work that Americans are, we don't have enough uh, population growth on our own to meet, and there is this massive demand for immigrants, so we need these immigrants. On the other hand, uh, immigration comes at a cost to, especially when it's disordered and chaotic uh, as it has been, to a lot of people, including a lot of people who are uh uh, on the margins of the economy, right? And those, both of those things are true, and they exist in tension. It's not one is true and the other is false. They exist in tension. So hopefully what we're able to do is talk about things in a little bit of a grown-up way that is doesn't get very often the opportunity to be heard on TV because people are looking for the soundbite, they're looking for the talking point, they're looking for uh, the marching orders for the week. Hopefully, we're going to talk about things uh, like grown-ups. We always love when we get to talk like grown-ups. We don't see it enough on cable news. Finally, you know, you mentioned immigration. What are some of the other big issues you're tracking? Well, look, I mean, th- we talked about we talked about another one, which is uh, reproductive rights, uh, elective access, access to elective abortion. So you, this is an election that for, if you want to think about how persuadable voters are going to make up their mind, you're holding attention these two things, which is there are a lot of people who uh, are, are very upset about immigration. And this includes, by the way, a lot of Democrats and a lot of persuadable voters. But then you have some of those same voters who are very anxious about Republican efforts to repeal access to uh, abortion for women. And those two things exist in tension. And I think these are the two biggest issues that are probably going to... Uh, obviously, we stipulate the economy, the economy, the economy, the economy is always the story. But underneath that, I think this is an election that's about... Uh, disagreement on immigration and a disagreement on abortion. Absolutely. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. And it's good to see you, uh, I guess, outside of the the Hill on News Nation universe um, in a different setting. So and I I loved grilling you. (laughs) I'm glad I survived the grilling. I made it through. I can I can I can notch a win. You made it through. Well, thank you. And you can see The Hill Sunday with Chris Steyerwalt Sunday mornings at 10, 9 central, only on News Nation.
The official start date for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is 1948, which followed the 1947 UN partition of Palestine. But depending on who you talk to, the conflict goes back far, even farther than that. Here to give us more perspective on this conflict from George Washington University is Associate Professor of International Affairs, Ned Lazarus. Ned, thank you so much for being here. You know, historically, uh, how have Americans viewed this conflict? And are you seeing a generational divide really play out in the way Americans are viewing it today? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, historically, Americans have viewed the conflict, uh, you know, have viewed Israel much more favorably than the Palestinians, uh, have viewed certainly uh, Israel much more favorably than any of the uh, organizations, whether the PLO or Hamas, uh, uh, that have represented the Palestinians. Uh, and with the you know, broad American public, that remains true. Uh, but there is a, a very clear generational divide uh, that public opinion surveys have shown consistently uh, during the period since the October 7th Hamas attacks and uh, uh, Israel's war against Hamas in the months that have followed. Uh, and that gap seems to, uh, uh, it is consistent and it has uh, perhaps even grown. Uh, but I'm looking at uh, the most recent Pew Research Center surveys of American opinion. Uh, and you can see that uh, whereas American adults in general uh, sympathize more with Israel than with the Palestinians uh, and are more sympathetic to uh, or, or tend to see Israel's uh, goals for the war as, uh, as legitimate, uh, more of them than the Palestinians. When you look at ages 18 to 29, uh, it is often um, a reverse picture. Uh, there are more younger adults that sympathize with the Palestinians than with the Israelis. Um, and uh, uh, there are also among the 18 to 29 demographic more support uh, uh, for, uh, for Hamas, although it's, it remains uh, still uh, a minority, but more, much more critical views uh, of Israel's reasons for fighting and how Israel is fighting. You know, following the Israeli strike of the World Central Kitchen aid workers, President Biden has since hinted at a potential U.S. policy change towards Israel if Israel does not do more to avoid or prevent civilian deaths. If there is a policy change in U.S.-Israel policy, how significant would that be? Uh, it would be significant indeed, uh, because rhetorical differences uh, and even some very direct confrontations and very harsh uh, criticism is not actually a new element of the U.S.-Israel relationship. Uh, U.S. administrations have clashed with Israeli leaders, particularly from the right wing of Israeli politics and particularly with Benjamin Netanyahu. He has had very serious public confrontations with President Clinton, with President Obama, and now with President Biden. So harsh, uh, harsh words being exchanged uh, uh, is not actually something new, but a shift in policy uh, uh, and a shift in uh, particularly this administration's strong support for Israel in the wake of the atrocities that Hamas committed on October 7th, uh, uh, th that would be a momentous shift, a very serious shift. Uh, and uh, it is evidence of uh, quite real and palpable frustration uh, in the administration. Uh, similar, perhaps, if we're asking about public opinion, uh, to, uh, you know, while, while the administration continues to say that the, the reason this war happened is because of Hamas, the war would end if Hamas would release the hostages. Uh, nonetheless, the administration is, has become extremely frustrated with the way that Israel is fighting and with the way that Israel has behaved in terms of uh, humanitarian aid uh, and the, uh, the uh, you know, accidental killing of seven World Central Kitchen workers this week uh, is certainly is a, a low point and may prove to be a turning point. Uh, the, the fact that the administration even mentions in public statements the possibility of shifting its policy uh, is really that is an escalation. Uh, that's not just that, that's saying we're, we, we are not uh, this is not just words. This is not just rhetoric. We are very serious. Uh, and uh, Israel is now, uh, you know, extremely dependent on the United States. Uh, it's dependent for the United States uh, for uh, military support 
if Israel uh, uh, moves into a larger regional conflict with Hezbollah and Iran, um, it may also be dependent on the United States for uh, uh, military, for armaments, uh, if it is, uh, you know, if the war with Hamas continues, uh, as it appears to be uh, uh, continuing now, and the, Israel is dependent on the United States for political support. The United States is Israel's really, at this point, last bastion of uh, political support internationally. Uh, so uh, yeah. the, 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 the U.S. administration, uh, you know, threatening a shift in policy uh, is something that would have real consequences for Israel. You know, the UN in many ways is responsible for the creation of the modern day state of Israel, but it continues to face accusations of anti-Semitism most recently for its very slow acknowledgement of claims of sexual violence against Israeli women during the October 7th Hamas terror attacks. Talk about the role of the UN in this conflict. Uh, the UN uh, and Israel have always had a very fraught relationship. Uh, Israel does, absolutely. It is created by a UN resolution, UN Resolution 181. Uh, uh, UN Resolutions 242 and 338 are the legal basis for the Middle East peace process. Uh, and our, our, uh, and Israel you know, has, uh, certainly has accepted them from uh, uh, the beginning. But Israel has also always rebuffed UN criticism of its behavior and conflicts. Uh, in uh, the 1948 war, David Ben-Gurion, the founding prime minister of Israel, uh, famously said in Hebrew uh, of the UN, um shmum, that uh, sort of translates to UN shmuen, as mm -hmm. in, I'm not listening to what they say, we will do what we have to do. Uh, and that attitude, uh, you know, certainly continues. This is not unique to Israel. Uh, both parties to the conflict uh, will, you know, stand proudly by UN resolutions that uh, they see as in their interest, while completely denying the validity of UN resolutions that contradict their, their policy. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, what you mentioned, uh, and, and Israel also has long felt that uh, th the UN General Assembly, uh, things like the UN Human Rights Council are, you know, uh, systematically biased mm -hmm. against Israel. And they will point to the fact that on the UN Human, Human Rights Council, countries that have egregious records of human rights violations uh, will pass multiple resolutions condemning Israel uh, without applying any scrutiny to their own records. Right. Um, so this this has existed for a long time. But in the current conflict, uh, there are two points uh, where this has uh, you know hit new lows. Um, mm -hmm. And one of those is what you mentioned, uh, the you know, the it, it, completely inexcusable and unexplainable uh, uh, you know, months that it took for an organization like UN Women to say anything uh, uh, or condemn uh, the systematic sexual violence committed by Hamas on October 7th, testified to by multiple witnesses uh, in, you know, credible reports that were issued very soon afterwards. Uh, and uh, it took months for anything to happen. The UN has in recent months, uh, both conducted its own investigation and held a Security Council session on the issue. So it has it has moved and it has done important right. things now, but it, it took months and, and, and painful protest uh, uh, for uh, uh, of survivors of, uh, right. you know, of October 7th for that to happen. That's a that is a definitely a new low. Mm. Uh, in, in what has always been a very tense relationship. All right, right. Well, Ned Lazarus, thank you so much for helping us break it all down. It's such a complex and you know, very um, you know, heavy issue. We really appreciate your time and expertise on it. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope uh, for better news. Me too. Thank you. Americans are even more divided on military aid for Israel in the wake of the recent deadly strike against aid workers. Israel has historically received more military aid from America than any other country. Staff writer Rafael Bernal digs deeper into the numbers. In the decades since World War II, Israel has been by far the largest recipient of U.S. foreign aid in general and military aid in particular. Since 1980, military aid to Israel has hovered between $3 billion and $4.7 billion per year, adjusted to constant 2022 dollars, according to the Council on Foreign Relations. In the decade before that, the military aid package went from less than a quarter billion dollars in 1970 
to massive ups and downs. 12 billion in 1974, 7.7 .7 billion in 1976, and 13.2 billion in 1979. Those spikes reflect Israel's geopolitical woes. The 1974 number, for instance, it's tied to US help in the Yom Kippur War, when Israel was subject to a surprise attack by a coalition of its neighbors, led by Egypt and Syria. The $3 billion floor and relative stability since 1980, that stems from the after effects of that war. In 1978, Israel and Egypt signed a peace deal brokered by the United States. Those are the Camp David Accords. Since then, those two countries have become the most consistent recipients of military aid at a 3 to 1 ratio. Of the $10 billion the United States spent in 2022, for instance, $3.3 billion went to Israel and $1.1 billion went to Egypt. Egypt is the second biggest U.S. aid recipient, netting $78 billion in economic aid and $89 billion in military aid since 1946. Israel's $81 billion in economic aid is comparable, but it's received $216 billion in military aid. The next four historical recipients in economic and military aid they're Afghanistan, South Vietnam, Iraq, and South Korea. Those are all countries where the United States has fought long wars. Turkey, a key Cold War ally, is up there in military aid. It has received 52 billion since 1946. And Ukraine popped up in military aid with the Russian invasion, surpassing Egypt in military aid in 2022, netting 1.5 billion in military aid. Fiscal 2023 is a different story. Worldwide military aid went down to 7.7 .7 billion, and Ukraine, it only got 81 million. A $61 billion package in security-related aid to Ukraine is stalled in Congress. And another big military aid package is facing political headwinds. The Biden administration is proposing 14 billion in military aid to Israel, given the expenses of the war in Gaza. U.S. military aid to Israel has historically come with few strings attached, though it must comply with U.S. law, and there have been a few disagreements in the past. But Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's conduct of the war in Gaza has come under serious criticism, especially after the attack that killed seven humanitarian aid workers in three World Central Kitchen cars. Now, Democrats are pushing Biden to either stop the 14 billion or put serious conditions on the aid package. But there's another US law to consider. In 2008, the US passed a bill to maintain what's known as Israel's quantitative military edge. That means Israel's US provided weapons have to outmatch anything the United States sells to Israel's neighbors. This presidential election could come down to one key demographic, women. Both sides of the aisle are fighting to sway women voters this election cycle as reproductive rights emerge as one of the top issues hitting the ballot. In recent election cycles, millions more women than men have registered to vote. And in every presidential election since 1964, they've topped men in terms of turnout numbers. It's time to go on the record with Scott Tranter, director of data science from Decision Desk HQ. Scott, let's jump right into it. Trump recently came out against a national abortion ban, saying it should be left to the states. Are we seeing a shift in how the GOP is handling what is really becoming a top issue for voters this election cycle? We absolutely are. It's interesting. You know, I'm always amazed to see Donald Trump does, you know, he does his own live focus groups, right? He looks around and he says, okay, what do I need to say um, to get the biggest applause or the biggest support? And his statement on abortion um, is, is clearly geared to the more moderate wing of the GOP independents and certainly maybe some Democrats who's, who, 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 who may vote for him, you know, basically coming out saying, you know, look to, look to the states. And that's pretty smart given the data we've seen around abortion and elections over the last couple of years. There was a very contentious issue in Kansas and Ohio um, around abortion and Democrats came out and independents came out and overwhelmingly struck some of those things down. We're going to see abortion or abortion related issues on the ballot in states like Florida and a few others this year. Um, and it's clearly a motivating factor for Democrats on the money side. That's 
pretty clear cut. And there's there's plenty of evidence to show it, it really motivates um, not only Democratic voters, but independent and some moderate Republican voters um, uh, on the issue. So it's a vote driver. Uh, it's a money driver. And we even see Donald Trump moderating his position because he looked at he looked across what the, 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 the majority of public opinion is on it and said, you know, my party need my, my party basically needs to moderate on this and I can't be so strong on the message. Right, right. And one of those groups you mentioned, suburban women voters, have been one of the most critical demographics of Trump since at least 2018, when the group really helped Democrats push back against the former president and Republicans during those midterm elections. Are we seeing Trump and the GOP struggle to win over suburban women voters this cycle, um, you know, after they've become so consequential, really, to the past few elections? We absolutely have suburban women voters, even we're going to we're seeing some signs of suburban men in terms of, you know, uh, tax issues, some of the more war in Ukraine, um, war in Israel issues, those types of things. Suburban suburban voters are the ba- are, are the battleground for both parties this year. And it's a segment of the population Republicans have historically done very well with well with. But, you know, all the talk is around. Is there a political realignment for the parties? Um, you know, because. 10, 15 years ago, Mitt Romney would solidly win the suburbs um, and the Republicans are, are having to fight for that demographic now. Um, you know, and you're, you're seeing that and how some of the issues are playing out. That's for sure. Looking back to 2020, seven in 10 Latina women said they voted for President Biden. How are Democrats fighting this election cycle to keep that vote as we've seen Hispanics and Latinos and Latinas really start to become more of a swing constituency? Well, we see it, you know, the Trump camp, I'm sorry, the Biden campaign has come out and and specifically stated this is a priority for them. Um, Again, the polling shows that there's some softening of support uh, among the Hispanic um, vote for Democrats. And while it's expected the Democrats are going to win that demographic, they need to win it by 7, 80 percent. You know, they need to win it with 70, 80 percent of the vote. Um, If a Republican like Donald Trump were able to get 30 or 35 percent of the Hispanic vote, which Republicans haven't seen since George W. Bush, um, ran for president, that would be a huge, huge win for the Republicans and could change the race um, in his favor in states like Nevada and Arizona. Democrats have really started to ditch the term Bidenomics. Looking at recent polling number, we see that black women uh, say the cost of living and inflation are among their top issues. We know that black women played a consequential role in flipping Georgia in 2020. Um, can Democrats flip that state if they don't streamline their message on the economy? Yeah, no, it's it's certainly a risk. And it's funny, you know, the reason why, at least from a polling perspective, why they dropped it is, while you can put every economic metric and jobs and consumer reports and all these these books about it out and say, hey, look at the data. The data says that, you know, the economy is good. At the end of the day, we did have record inflation the past couple of years. And that's really how people view the economy is how much does it cost for eggs? How much does it cost for gas? Can I afford to go on that vacation? Those types of things. Um, do I got to work two jobs? Those, those types of things. They don't look at, you know, man, unemployment's down 0.2 percentage points or, you know, inflation only went up two and a half percent. You know, to them, that's great. It only went two and a half percent, but it's still, you know, $15 to eat at McDonald's when it used to be seven. And I think that that's the issue that's hitting all Americans. And, and you know, you cite your staff from African-American women. Um, you know, a lot of these women in some of these states, they're the ones who do the grocery shopping or they're the ones who see the front lines of this stuff right. um, when they're when they're buying the food. Trump's nationwide lead has been narrowing by the week. It's now just 0.8 percent above Biden. Do you think we could see Biden top Trump soon? Yeah, no, look, the averages are certainly trending that way. Um, And I think we're going to see a big seesaw over the summer. Right. So Joe Biden has just started spending tens of millions of dollars in some of these swing states. He's he's on pace to have a billion dollars and will certainly ramp up his spending later this summer. The the Donald Trump, the RNC has money, but not nearly as much. And so, you know, like we always see in politics, money moves votes and, you know, Joe Biden spending it. So I expect, it, you know, Joe Biden to overtake him. But I also wouldn't be surprised to see it seesaw back to Trump later in the summer as the campaign heats up. This is going to be a close race right down to the wire. Yeah, we'll certainly see a polling roller coaster. Biden just got some good news out of Michigan. A new poll shows he's now up 3% over Trump. What other states should we be watching? Uh, you know, the 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 hot one this week that's that kind of made some notes, and I know you and I talked about in the past, is Nevada. 
Um, and it linked it to the, the Hispanic vote we talked about. Republicans are making some inroads there. Um, the Democrats have an incumbent senator whose polling is soft, expected to win. Um, but, you know, the, the Republicans are going to field a good candidate. And that's a, that's a state with a lot of union workers that had his, historically been for the Democrats, but not not for sure anymore. Um, you know, that's that's the, kind of one of the other hot states to look at. and will be very consequential for both control of the Senate as well as, you know, the presidential race this fall. Uh, finally, how is Decision Desk tracking RFK Jr.'s performance in his three way race with Trump and Biden? Do you think we're seeing a significant drop in RFK's polling numbers? Yeah, it, 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 we are. It's certainly measurable in the average. Um, and a lot of it is, is look, the Democrats had come out and said the Biden campaign actually started a team, hired some people specifically um, there to to campaign and combat against RFK's rising popularity. The Republicans have yet to do so. But, you know, they're going to they're, they're also going to be worried about it going into the fall just because he's taken away. I expect RFK's numbers to dip down a little bit, but. All he needs is two or three or four or five percent in a state like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, where it looks like he he's got a good chance to get on the ballot. He's not there yet, but he's certainly shown some organization prowess where he doesn't he, he could still lose some of his support and still play a, a major factor in the race this fall. Well, Scott Tranter, as always, thank you for helping us break it down. We'll see you next week. Thanks for having me. Thanks. And that's it for What's America Thinking. Come back next week. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And we want to hear from you. Leave your comments and let us know what's on your mind.